Good afternoon. Welcome to the first audio lecture for Nursing 221. Um, this lecture is uh, does coincide with our first week, which is going to be August 19th. I'm going to be going over prioritization, delegation, and assignment, and um, conflict resolution, just some management type issues. You will need the information that's listed in Canvas about um, it says items that are, will be needed in class. It's some information from the State Board of Nursing and um, Joint Commission. So I'm going to be referring to that information during the lecture. So you will need that available to you. Uh, I wanted to let you know that this particular lecture for this week doesn't come out of a textbook that you have. Some of it comes from your 101 class, but I don't believe that y'all have the same textbook anymore. So um, for testing purposes, the information will come straight from this PowerPoint. Okay, so there's not any any real reading material for you to review. All right, objectives for this lecture. We're talking about prioritization of nursing care. We're going to look at um, leadership and management and the differences between the two things. We're going to talk about some different leadership styles, how to develop leadership styles, and then we're going to look at um, basic characteristics of good communication. All right, so what is leadership and what is management? Um, not all leaders are managers and not all managers are leaders okay so leadership is the ability to get people to do um, what you need them to do it's it's the ability to persuade people to follow your direction or um, you know instilling a purpose or a vision in them management is just um, organization of activities directing activities uh, being able to um, facilitate uh, m um, activities within a department, planning out such as staffing, uh, could be patient flow or patient uh, placement. So they're really kind of different. Not everybody who's a leader is a good manager and not everybody who's a manager is a good leader. So they are actually two, two, two different things. It can be said that leaders do the right thing and managers do things right and there's a difference I want you to think about that because there is a difference in those things doing things right means following the rules and policy and procedure which is very important and you will hear me refer to that quite often but being able to do the right thing sometimes in nursing the right thing for the patient or the right thing for the family is not necessarily what the policy says so there can be gray area there so just understand that there's a difference between these two things management can be taught uh, people can learn how to be good managers they can learn how to facilitate departments and plan activities but it's very hard to teach someone to be a leader most of the time you're either born with those characteristics or it is a it's a personality trait that you come you know come into the world with sometimes leaders can be born or developed but usually it's it's in rare cases where they've had some personal experiences and they become very passionate and so they it's that passion that really drives them and gets people to um, really follow their leading. Two, uh, two more terms that we're going to talk about in terms of leadership is accountability and authority. So accountability and responsibility, um, you will hear me refer to these quite often as well in, uh, throughout the course of the semester. Accountability or responsibility is just being um, responsible for your own actions. It's an obligation to answer for your own actions. Okay, um, You do what you say you're going to do. You don't do what you say you're not going to do. If you mess up, you, you take the blame for it. You 
you readily accept responsibility. Okay, that's accountability. You know your own limits, um, and that is a key to, you know, making accountability, making it work is that you know your limits. You know when to say, all right, enough's enough. Authority is the power or um, the ability to give directions, influence people, you know, tell them what to do. Okay, maybe not in a bad way, but you have uh, authority to make decisions. You have authority to um, tell other people how to function, where to function. Authority can um, be assigned to you, like through a job title. You might be the manager of that unit. Or it can be implied, meaning you don't hold the official title, but you still, people see you, maybe because of your experience or maybe because of your knowledge, they still see you in somewhat of an authority position or as an authority f figure. Um, be, and it's kind of implied you're the unofficial boss of that area. And this can be a good or bad thing. Implied authority can be good or bad. You know, sometimes people, they've been working in an area for a very long time. They're very knowledgeable. They're very skilled. And, you know, maybe the true leader of that unit or the true manager of that unit doesn't have that much experience. And so the the implied authority figure can be very beneficial. They can be helpful. They can help guide and shape the unit. If that implied leader is someone who has a sour attitude, is bitter, or um, unwilling to be helpful, that implied power and implied authority can actually very much influence that department in a negative aspect. So, you know, assigned power, assigned authority, is it comes with your job title. That implied authority is something that comes from the people who are around you or who work in that area and it's just a perception. There are different leadership styles um, that you're gonna encounter once you go to work. You're gonna see different leadership styles here while you're in school and um, I would really encourage you to begin to think about your own style of leadership um, because even in the class, you know, even as students, some of you are leaders. Some of you are in a position to influence others. So I would really encourage you to begin to think about your own leadership style. Um, autocratic or authoritarian, this is where the leader makes the majority of the decisions. There's just not a lot of input from any of the staff. And that could be because um, there's there's just a lot of staff, there's a lot of employees, and it's too many to get input from, or it could be that the leader, the manager, just, it's just easier for them to make the decisions rather than ask the staff. So that's autocratic. Democratic or participative is where you do get some input and decision making from the employees. It's encouraged. There are a lot of um, meetings or opportunities where staff can voice their opinions and help to actually shape the function of that unit. Laissez-faire, or the permissive style, is where there's little or no direction provided by the leader of the area. It's kind of a anything goes. It's just like, you know, whatever the staff wants to do, that's what they do. There's really not any influence or accountability in place. Um, so the staff often are kind of left on their own just to kind of function and figure things out by themselves. Um, a lot of times, you know, staff think that this is really a great way to function because they can do what they want to. And it can be very useful if you have staff who are, you know, of good character and really do the right thing. 
Um, but if you have staff who are not interested in following the rules and doing the right thing, this style can be very detrimental because there's no accountability. In the multicratic style, it's really a combination. It's the most favorable aspects of all of the others. It is the most frequently used in healthcare. Um, theoretically, um, that's what the text says. However, I don't know that you will always see that in your actual practice. But it's, you know, hopefully a, a, a little bit of all of them, okay? You know, when you have a when you have a department that only has five employees, you know, five nurses, it's really not that hard to get input from five people and get them to agree. But when you have a department that has 20 employees or 50 employees or you're running a hospital, you know, the DON who's running a hospital that has 300 employees, it's not, there's no way that you can get 300 people to agree on one thing. So you can see how these different leadership styles would come into play. As you move out of school and you go into practice and you begin to de develop a leadership style or leadership roles, things that you need to think about, you need to really um, focus on, you need to continue your learning, you need to always stay up to date on the latest and best evidence-based practice. Um, it's You're not going to be an effective leader if you are not aware of the most recent standards of care. You should always seek a role model uh, or a mentor of some sort in everything that you do. As you go to work, you need to align yourself with somebody who is, is of high standards, focuses on evidence-based practice, focuses on practicing in a safe, ethical way, and, and learn from them. Always try to maintain yourself personally, physically. Um, learn how to unwind. Learn how to relax. Nursing is a very stressful um, job. It's a very stressful and a very mentally taxing career field to be in. And there are going to be days when it's not just physically stressful, you know, it's going to be emotionally and mentally taxing. And so if you want to be able to function over a number of years in a very high stress situation, it's going to be essential that you learn how to decompress, how you, that you learn how to unwind and deal with the stress. Um, you've got to have an outlet. You've got to have a life outside of work. A very huge part of developing a, a good leadership style is to be open to suggestion. Be open to other people's ideas. Be willing to listen to people when they talk to you, when they come to you with a concern, or if they come to you with an idea about how to make things better. Be open to that. Be willing to listen to what they have to say. I can tell you from experience that there is nothing more frustrating than being in a position, being in a job where you don't have any input. And it's also very frustrating being in a job where they ask for your opinion, but then when you give it, nobody listens and nothing changes. Some of the best ideas and the best uh, changes in practice that have been cost effective and been best for our patient care have come from the, the staff who are actually providing the care. So as you begin to develop leadership, and I know y'all are thinking, who cares about being a leader or a manager right now? I'm just trying to get out of school. I understand that. But like I said, leadership doesn't always come from an assigned position. It, it often comes in an implied manner. And so if you are the kind of person who's willing to listen to other people and be flexible, you know, nurses get in a rut. We tend to want to do the same thing all the time because, you know, it took us two years to get out of school and then it took us another year to get comfortable where we're working and we just don't want to change. But being flexible and willing to try new things that can be better for our patients. That's the key to, to really developing good leadership style. 
Um, always be respectful of people. Always be considerate. Even if you don't agree with what they have to say or what they're doing, we can still be very respectful and considerate just because, you know, that's that's another human being. So respect and consideration is always appropriate. And lastly, have confidence in yourself. Believe that you know what you're doing. Know your limits. But, you know, when you are sure of something, then be confident about it. Okay, know your strengths, know your weaknesses, and have display that confidence in the things that you do know. Be willing to admit what you don't know, but be very confident in what you do know. Now that doesn't mean that you shove it down somebody else's throat, or that you, um, you know, we're going to do it my way or no way. But you know, if you know you're right, be confident about that. Okay. Always be willing. To learn something new okay because there's always going to be something that you don't know and even after you graduate once you go to work even me you know I've been doing this for 21 years and every time I go to the hospital there's something new that I can learn you never stop learning so be willing be open be flexible to say you know I'm not, I'm not familiar with that will you show me how that's the hallmark of a great leader. Communication is very important as well when you're talking about leadership. You want your um, communication to be very clear, very on point. You know, you don't want to spend 30 minutes trying to explain something to somebody that can be said in five. Why use, you know, 50 words when you can use 10? So be clear and be concise. Um, maintain this a very positive outlook um, and when we all know people who will say well I'm gonna ask you to do this but I know you probably don't want to so they're leading you already into a negative perception so as a leader we always want to to take a positive approach um, nobody likes change but the, work, the field of healthcare is ever evolving. There's constant change. And the effective leaders that I know, that I work with, are the ones that will tell you, yes, there's a change coming, but it's, it's a good change. It's going to be a positive thing for the patients. It's going to be a positive thing for the staff. So a positive approach. Um, always accommodate differences there are different learning styles you guys know there each one of you learns differently there's going to be some of you who love audio lectures and there's going to be some of you who hate audio lectures um, because we all have different learning styles so as a leader you've got to recognize what your staff really responds to and you've got to you know it's going to be different for each person but you have to meet each person where they are so you've got to recognize and accommodate different things diversity you got to be an active listener um, in communication the speaking aspect of communication is only half of it the in the listening the active listening and really hearing what's being said is the other half of communication. If all you're doing is talking and not listening, then you are not communicating. Go back and review your therapeutic communication techniques. They are essential and they are going to be very applicable. Um, especially this semester, you're going to be graded in clinical on your ability to communicate with not just the patients but the staff. And therapeutic communication is a big part of that. So make sure you go back and, and review therapeutic communication techniques. All right, so now we're going to move into uh, working in a leadership role and working with others as uh, in that leadership role. Uh, objectives here, we're going to talk about team building and um, some behaviors that will actually enhance the team building process. We're going to talk about delegation, why it's important in healthcare, what is delegation, how do you know how to do it, what's your responsibility as a nurse, 
and then um, we're going to talk a little bit about conflict management and conflict management strategies. Okay, so in healthcare, um, very often, very commonly now, you're going to hear the term healthcare team or inter interdisciplinary team. Um, not only is that just a new catchphrase, but that is in fact what happens. It's not just nurses doing their thing and doctors doing their thing and pharmacy doing their thing. We actually all work together. It's an interdisciplinary team, a multidisciplinary team. So it is in fact a group of people working together for a common goal, which is the best outcome for the patient that's possible. Um, effective functioning in healthcare as a team is critical to good quality patient care. Um, and some of the key factors that will build a good team are trust and respect for each other. Okay, now you can trust somebody even when you don't really know them or you don't really know their job. You know, I don't know how to be a pharmacist, but I trust my pharmacist. Okay, so trust can be built even though you don't personally know that person or how to do that job. And then respect is kind of where the trust comes from. Um, of course, respect for just a basic human being, but you know, having respect for their training, having respect for their expertise or their knowledge, you know, that leads you to trust that they will be able to function as part of your team in a very effective way. You also have to filter out your personal feelings. You don't have to like a person personally to be able to respect their knowledge and ability. Okay, so again, it's separating personal from professional. In team building, um, you know, some of the steps that we can take to really build a good healthcare team is to set common goals. You know, we've got to all know what we're working for. It can't be, you know, 10 different people doing their own thing and trying to accomplish 10 different tasks. But we all have to work together toward one common goal. So that goal has to be identified very early on. What are we working for? Again, going back to, you know, some of the leadership material, it's recognizing the contribution that each member makes to the team. Each part is important. If you have a team and you have one part that's not important to the common goal, then why is it a part of your team? You know, it everything that's in that's part of that healthcare team should be contributing valuable input, okay? So you've got to recognize the contribution that every person makes and, um, you know, see that it's a group effort. Involve, a, every, you know, everyone in the decision-making process. Again, back to the leadership. It's um, not just making a unilateral decision, but a give and take where we all work with each other. You f should always focus on um, the problem at hand or the problem itself rather than the individual or the person associated with that problem, okay? Um, we're not ever going to accomplish anything if all we do is um, tear down or speak negatively about people. Let's focus on what the problem is and work to find a solution to that problem. And then, usually when you can do that, then the people that are associated with that problem, it'll kind of resolve itself. And then you always share in the accomplishments. Um, you know, you know, with a team, the team works together, the team relishes in the accomplishments, and then they have to work together to overcome the problems, okay? Um, now, I have heard people say, in terms of leadership, that um, when something good happens, we did it. The whole team. We did it. We made that happen. 
But from a leadership perspective, when something bad happens or something goes wrong, then it's my fault. I did it. You know, a really good leader, a lot of times I've seen them take responsibility for something not going as planned rather than blaming it on the team. So, um, but everybody does share in the accomplishments because it's a team effort. It's not just one person that made something happen. Conflict management, that is part of the team building process and working as a team. Uh, again, you cannot, typically, you cannot get more than about three or four people together without there being some discussion, uh, conflicts, you know, of some kind. So, um, you know, it's very important to, to understand your perspective, your opinion about conflict and how to deal with it, okay? Um, there are some positives to conflict. You know, it's important that it can be a very uh, positive learning experience. You know, some people just tend to see conflict as a bad or a negative thing, but it can actually be a good learning process, okay? So a, um, a good leader is able to take a situation that maybe was very tense or you know maybe some trouble some conflict going on and can really break it down and isolate the things that were the root of the problem and then use it as a learning tool um, there are different types of conflict intrapersonal interpersonal and then intergroup and then of course organizational intrapersonal meaning you have conflict within yourself this is going to be um, the first thing I think of is, as I was talking about with the leadership, leaders do the right thing and managers do things right. Sometimes there will be a policy in place and maybe it's an old outdated policy that needs to be updated but it hasn't been updated and it's not best practice. It's not really what's best for your patient but it's an organizational policy and you need to follow it but yet you know if you follow it it's not going to do the best thing for your patient and so that creates an intrapersonal conflict you you within yourself are conflicted about what's right those are often things that are you know questions about morals or ethics um, those can create intrapersonal conflicts interpersonal means among other people or between people so that would be the typical conflict between me and another person. Um, you know, we have varying views, disagreement on perspective, or, uh, you know, might do one thing one way, you know, do, do a procedure a certain way, and I would do it a different way. So, I mean, inter means between two people. Intergroup, um, that can be seen many times in healthcare between different departments. You know, we as nurses often are quick to point fingers and judge and say they're lazy I don't know why they didn't do it better I don't know why they didn't do I mean we are quick to do that and so there are some times when you can see one department you know kind of at war or in conflict with another department and it can be a very tense and uncomfortable environment for everybody involved um, so, you know, working together and building a positive team is important to prevent that from happening. And then there can be organizational conflict. Um, that's, that can be when, um, let's say, people in management are making decisions and then the people who are actually providing patient care, you know, have to abide by the decisions, but they know that that they really aren't maybe best practice or you know they don't make sense or you know maybe those higher ups are telling us what to do and we don't really like it you know we don't we don't understand it um, there can be organizational conflict between say medical staff and nursing administration so you know it can it can come in different forms because there are multiple 
organizations within or multiple areas within the overall organization. So, um, you know, regardless of what type of conflict we're talking about, you individually, you need to be aware of how do you feel about conflict? Are you the person who tries to keep the peace? Are you the one who tries to avoid it at all costs? Are you the one who gets angry and says, you know, how dare that person come at me like that? Are you the person who keeps a level head and looks for the root of the problem? Are you quick to point fingers? Are you quick to blame somebody else? Do you accept responsibility yourself whether or not you had anything to do with it? So I mean there's various different ways that you can manage conflict but you need to know in yourself what's your tendency and that's going to help you um, identify how you're going to be able to handle bigger conflict. No matter the type of conflict that we're talking about, there's going to be an outcome, okay? And there's generally three possible outcomes. The lose-lose, where nobody wins, there's nothing accomplished, there's a negative, just negative on both sides. Both, both sides walk away feeling defeated. The win-lose, where one person or one side gets what they want and the other one doesn't. There's no conf uh, compromise. There's no working things out. It's a, it, almost a very clear one-sided victory. And then the win-win outcome is when there is compromise. Both parties walk away with a positive feeling about the end result. Now that does not mean that both people or both sides got exactly what they wanted, but it means that they left the table saying, okay, I can accept this. So that's win-win, and that's really the ultimate goal, is to, um, to walk away with a win-win situation. Some strategies for coping with conflict. There, you know, here again, it's you identifying how you feel about it. Are you the type that that walks away, withdraws, and avoids? Are you the peacekeeper? Do you have to kind of smooth everything over and, and try to fix it and make it better? Are you the person that um, you know it gets angry and? Uh, tries to force someone else to talk to you, to force the issue, you know, to get it out there or try to intimidate or bully that, uh, that other person or that other side? Um, are you the one who's willing to negotiate? Are you willing to, you know, the one that's will to talk about compromise, um, being a problem solver, you know, collaborating with the other people to try to, you know, work through because you can see with these different strategies how you can end up with the lose-lose or the win-lose or the win-win. So it's uh, important for you to be aware of what your strategy for coping up with conflict is. Okay, ways to be best prepared personally is you know, to evaluate, do you have a good working relationship with the people that surround you? Um, that doesn't mean that we are best friends with everybody we work with. It doesn't mean that even personally that we, you know, really like that person. But we do we have respect and trust for the people that we work with? How do you manage stress personally? How do you cope? How do you deal? You know, um, that's very important in conflict management because if you're the person who does not handle stress well then you're going to be the person who escalates and gets worked up and anxious very quickly and that can make situations of conflict it can make them very um, it can make them worse quicker do you have that proper uh, outlet do you have a good balance between work and relaxation that's again very important when managing conflict. 
Um, how competent do you feel in a given situation? You know, do you feel like you are able to handle what you're being faced with? That can lead to intrapersonal conflict. If you don't feel like you've been adequately trained or you're competent or you're not ready, especially if you're a new graduate and you are going out in, into the work in, environment and you, I mean, I understand that nobody feels like they're ready, but, it, you know, if it's your second day on the job and someone, you know, asks you to go do a, a, a procedure that you've never done before, and really don't know very much about, then you don't feel competent, you don't feel safe. And that can create some intrapersonal conflict. So your you know, knowing how you're gonna handle that ahead of time is very important. Um, what personal biases do you have that might be interfering with your interactions with other people, especially your coworkers? That's a cultural thing, that can be an educational thing, it can be um, a race thing. So we have to be very aware of our own personal feelings and biases. Uh, we live in a multicultural city. We live uh, in a world where many different aspects of personal activities are, you know, ex accepted, and so, you know, my personal feelings toward a certain behavior or a certain, you know, lifestyle or a certain culture should not influence or should not prohibit me from showing respect for another human being, okay? So being aware of your own personal feelings and your personal biases are very important. And then evaluating, you know, what else is going on in your life. Are you having personal issues? Are you having problems at home? Are you having problems with your kids? Uh, in the school setting, you know, you're going to school full time. Are you also trying to work full time? Are you raising a family as well? Are you the sole sor source of income? You know, there's a lot of different things that can impact you um, and can in influence your ability to, to deal with conflict. So the bottom line here is to identify your personal feelings and how you handle conflict and then identify and deal with personal issues appropriately. You know, leave your personal issues at home in an arena that can be dealt with personal issues. We should never bring our personal issues to work and we should never bring our personal issues to school, okay? And so if you are, are facing or dealing with something uh, personally that is affecting your professional life, then number one, you've got to sit back and identify that and realize that that's what's happening. And then you've got to develop a way to cope with it and handle it and either move forward or know that you need to take a pause. Okay, because sick people don't stop being sick and needing our help because because we're having a bad day. I mean, I, I I understand there's a balance. Nurses have families. I have kids, and I have to reckon within myself where my boundary is. Where you know what's the point when my family comes first over my job? because my job is very important to me. So I have to I have to reckon that within myself, okay? But, you know, there are people, and I'm sure you all have experienced it, that come in every day and they have a problem. Every day they have a, a pro, an issue, a story, a drama, and, and that tends to bleed over to everyone else and it can actually be very disruptive in the workplace. So our focus is our patients. And whenever we're dealing with personal issues that distract us from our patients, then we are taking away from what we owe that sick person. 
Okay, we owe that patient 150% of our focus and attention and our abilities. And so if we're in a place where our personal problems are being so distracting that we can't give that 150%, then we have to really take a step back and say, okay, what's going on and what do I need to do about it? Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is delegation. Um, that is the process of directing other people or other members of the team to perform uh, nursing tasks or various activities. Um, in nursing, we're going to talk a lot about delegation, um, delegation of authority, okay? And it is all governed by the Louisiana State Nurse Practice Act. Um, that can be found on the Louisiana State Board of Nursing website. It's very important that we are familiar with the Nurse Practice Act and what it says we can delegate and what it says we cannot delegate, okay? Uh, so in all cases of delegation, the nurse remains accountable for everything. Even if it's delegated to another person, we retain the responsibility for that activity, ultimately. So uh, that's why it's so important to know what is acceptable to delegate to someone else and what's not. S um, because ultimately, if something goes wrong, then it comes back to the RN. We are ultimately accountable for that activity, even though we asked somebody else to do it. So we've got to follow the guidelines set forth by the state and know you know, what can and can't be delegated. So when you're trying to decide, you know, whether or not to delegate an activity, you've got to know, um, you know, when is it okay to delegate and when is it not? Who can I delegate it to? What activities are acceptable to, to delegate and what activities do I need to do myself? I've got to make sure that the person I'm delegating to is the right person for that job. You know, they've got to be knowledgeable and trained to be able to do it correctly. And then I have to be able to supervise or oversee, follow up on the task that I have asked someone else to do. Because it is ultimately, you know, I remain responsible and accountable for that activity. So five rights of successful delegation, just like um, the five rights of nursing, uh, of medication administration, which now I think is up to six or seven, but there are five basic rights of successful delegation. The right task, the right circumstances, the right person, the right direction or slash communication, and the right supervision and evaluation, follow-up, okay? The pictures that you see on the right-hand side of this slide are from the handouts from the State Board. It's the decision tree pertaining to delegation of activities to licensed practical nurses and the decision tree pertaining to delegation of tasks to non-licensed personnel. That would be like your nursing assistants. So you would um, you can pull out these handouts and you can look at them yourself. It's very cut and dried. You start with the task at, at hand and ask yourself, is the task within the RN scope of practice? Yes, it is. No, it's not. Or you're not sure. Okay, and it, and it tells you where to go. Yes, it is. And you move on down the decision tree. Um, so here we are right here. Is the task within the RN scope of practice? Yes. So we move down here. Does the agency have policies and procedures in place for this task? Yes. Okay, so we're talking about LPNs. Has the LPN received any training or documented um, any documentation that they're competent to perform the task? Yes then you can go ahead and delegate that task to that person, okay? So you can see at any point in time, does the agency have a policy and procedure? No, they do not. D 
do not proceed until policy and procedure. So you see how this works. You just follow, you know, it's a yes or no type thing and you just follow it on down and it tells you according to the State Board of Louisiana, yes you can delegate this or no you cannot. And then it works the same way here with our non-licensed or unlicensed personnel. Is this task within the scope of RN practice? So you can see that ultimately the RN is held responsible. If you are, if it's not within the scope of practice for an RN, then you have no business delegating it to someone else. Okay? If it's a task that you yourself as the RN cannot legally perform, then you absolutely have no business delegating it to an LPN or an unlicensed person. All right, before you delegate, you have to know, again, your own scope of practice. Is it within the RN scope of practice? If not, it cannot be delegated. You also have to know who you can delegate those tasks to, okay? So um, pull out your state board handouts and let's look at what Louisiana has to say about delegation. Okay, I want you to find the page that's labeled RN Scope of Practice and Guideline for Interpretation. Um, there's several pages, I know that, but that's the, the name of that page. It's the RN Scope of Practice and Guideline for Interpretation, and then there's another one, Delegation Decision-Making Process for LPNs and Unlicensed Personnel. Okay, so those are the two I'm going to be referring to. Um, there are also some terms associated with these, with these handouts that you're going to want to be familiar with. Um, it falls under administrative rules of defining RN practice and, there, and it's just definitions accountability assignment collaborating delegating nursing interventions so um, and I believe that falls under the RN scope of practice handout so uh, the thing I want to focus on under the RN scope of practice, under that section that says administrative rules, um, there's a section kind of at the bottom of that page. It talks about delegating nursing intervention, and it gives it the definition, the state board definition. And then there are some criteria that says, you know, any situation where tasks are delegated should meet the following criteria. The person is adequately trained, they've demonstrated skill in that area, they can perform the task very safely in the given situation, the patient's status is safe for that person to carry out that task, and appropriate supervision is available. So there again, it goes back to those, those um, standards that we have to follow. The other thing that I want to really focus on here is the difference between, or not the difference, but things that can be, um, how do you know what you can delegate to an LPN and how do you know what you can delegate to a, an unlicensed personnel? Um, you know, it's going to be hard enough for us to keep up with what we can do as, as an RN, but knowing someone else's scope of practice is a whole nother ball game. It's really very simple. The Louisiana State Board of Nursing says that um, the registered nurse can delegate to a licensed practical nurse, to an LPN, the major part of nursing care needed by individuals in stable nursing situations. Okay, and stable nursing situations is defined by basically three conditions. Um, that the nursing care that's ordered and directed requires abilities based on a relatively fixed and limited uh, body of scientific fact 
and the care can be performed by following a defined procedure with very minimal need for alteration and the response of the patient to that nursing care is it has a predictable outcome that the change in the patient's clinical condition is predictable and that the orders are not um, subject to change or they're not complex in nature okay now LPNs um, our whole focus for you this semester is to shift the way you think you've been trained to think like an RN you've been trained I mean to, to think like an LPN you function as an LPN and there are practice differences I hope as we progress that your thinking will shift and you will you will begin to think like an RN and think about you know begin to critically think and look at things from the standpoint of why is this happening what's going to be the outcome of this if I do this you know the if then statements if this then that so it's a different way of, of looking at things the state board says uh, complex or unstable situations are reserved for the RN um, the registered nurse may utilize the expertise of an LPN by delegating selected tasks in unstable situations however there are six things that the State Board of Nursing in Louisiana says cannot be delegated to an LPN and that's um, investigational drugs chemotherapeutic medications giving medications by IV push administering blood and blood products administering TPN and accessing an implanted device such as a portacath those are six activities that the Louisiana State Board of Nursing says an LPN cannot perform that is not within an LPN scope of practice so those are six skills or tasks that an, uh, are it's not legal for an RN to delegate to an LPN okay so and it's not okay for us as the RN to say well I didn't know that wasn't okay ignorance is not a defense in the court of law ignorance of the law is not a defense and it's also not okay for you to say well the LPN didn't tell me she couldn't do it that's not okay either I'm telling you right now according to the Louisiana State Board these are six things that cannot be delegated to an LPN now you know um, you know there's a lot of responsibility that comes with delegation now I am not saying that LPNs are not smart enough that they're not skilled that they are not intelligent I'm not saying that there are many LPNs that I have worked with in my career that were fantastic that were just equally intelligent equally skilled equally knowledgeable the only difference was they had an LPN license and I had an RN license but that does not change the fact that the state board says this is what's okay and if I want to keep my license this is what I have to do and I want to keep my license because that's how I get paid and if I don't get paid I don't get to eat and I like to eat and my kids like it when I feed them so I'm gonna keep my license now when it comes to unlicensed personnel the state board there the way that they say you know what can be delegated and what can't be delegated is is determined by what they call a complex task versus a non-complex task okay non-complex task is something that can be performed safely in accordance with exact directions there's no variation to the steps of that of the directions or the steps of the process it's something that that unlicensed personnel can follow one two three they're going to get a very predictable outcome a predictable result every time they do it 
It does not require any judgment, decision making, or critical thinking on the part of the person who's performing the activity. Non-complex tasks can be delegated to unlicensed personnel. A complex task is defined by the State Board of Nursing as something that requires judgment or decision making to be carried out safely. It's a, it's a task where the steps may have to be altered or adjusted depending on how the patient responds. So, you know, that's a complex task and that is not within the scope of practice to be delegated to an unlicensed personnel. Okay, so anything that requires judgment, critical thinking, or reasoning, you know, you might have to alter the steps or the outcome is not predictable, that cannot be delegated to a nursing assistant or unlicensed personnel. Okay, so that's very important. That's something very important that the State Board of Nursing in Louisiana focuses on. Now, if you go to another state, their Nurse Practice Act might be different, and I would very much encourage those of you who are planning on moving out of Louisiana that you get on that state's nurse practice, nurse uh, state board site, and pull up their Nurse Practice Act and see, you know, what their standards are in relation to delegation. All right, so bottom line, according to the state board, delegation is inappropriate if the task is outside the scope of practice of the person you're trying to delegate to, if it requires independent specialized nursing judgment or knowledge, um, again if it falls outside the scope of practice or job description of the RN, then it absolutely cannot be delegated. And then if the nurse doesn't have enough time to follow up or supervise, and by supervise, I don't mean that you go in the room with that person and stand over their shoulder and watch them do it, but you ask, let's say you ask um, an LPN to administer an IV piggyback for you. They go do it, you have to follow up. You have to go make sure that that patient got that medication and they got all of it in a timely manner. If you as the RN don't have time to do that follow-up or don't have time to um, supervise that activity, then you should never delegate it to start with. Delegation is not dumping off your work on somebody else. Delegation is asking someone else to perform the activity and then you following up to make sure it was done accurately and giving them feedback as such. Letting them know, hey, thanks for doing that for me. Um, I really like how you did that. That was really good. I'm going to remember that next time and do it that way myself. And then if it's not done, you know, accurately being able to say to that person, hey, you know, I really appreciate you taking the time to go do that for me, um, but I noticed that uh, the piggyback didn't completely finish, so next time maybe we need to do this. Being a positive influence and giving constructive feedback, that is part of the evaluation process.